Like, it was Dragon Lord, Dragon Lord, Dragon Lord, Dragon Lord. So I was like, dude, this is magic. <laughs> like, this is awesome. Hello, Magic players. Welcome to the Wake the Dead podcast, your weekly Magic the Gathering podcast brought to you by MTG Mind Games. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel for weekly magic-related content, news, deck techs, and pack openings. I'm your host, Scott, and with me today is my co-host, Evan. Evan, what's up, man? Oh, not much. Uh, eventually, I'll figure out something to actually say during this. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> All right, so this episode will probably be coming to you guys a couple days late. Uh, we apologize for that, but it's for a very good reason. Uh, this past weekend we just watched the pro tour happen in uh brussels belgium so um what do you did you get a chance to watch anything evan with the pro tour i, I didn't get a chance to watch anything but i, I took i took a look at the deck lists and I, I gotta say there's some pretty awesome stuff that was played this right. weekend yeah so let's go over a little bit uh we're not gonna go over the full deck list we're gonna go over some highlights that we thought were uh important to the standard metagame and in general just going forward and how cards might be affected uh, with price and things like that. Um, so first up, basically, congratulations to Martin Dang. Dang! Hey. <laughs> uh, piloting mono red aggro, uh, or as everyone else would usually call it, red deck wins. Um, many people have been calling it mono red aggro despite its inclusion of a uh, number of green cards. That's why it just feels more like a red deck. But the green cards that are pretty much important are the Become Immense and Atarka's Command. Um, so what do you think about this deck, Evan? I actually really like it. I was I was taking a look at it uh, a little more closely this morning. And I, it seems like as much as I dislike playing red, I actually think I would enjoy this deck. Right. I didn't realize, and when I when I opened my boxes of M15, I looked at Foundry Street Denizen, and I didn't think that it was going to be anything special. And then I was looking at his, play, his playlist for this, and I was like, man... Foundry Street Denizen is ridiculous with yeah. this. Yeah, every I mean every red creature that comes out and he's running tons of red creatures are just gonna buff this thing. Yeah. Dragon Fodder. Oh hey look there there you go it's a three one now. It's just disgusting. Or the net burst. Oh now it's a four one. Yeah that's yep. The thing is I mean it says something that he's playing a creature that's a one drop that doesn't have haste. Okay so. You have Frenzied Goblin doing things like uh, whenever it attacks, uh, target creature can't block. So obviously that's going to make way for his Rabble Master or a Zergo with Dash or something like mm -hmm. that. But you have four Foundry Street Denizens. He's only got one Frenzied Goblin for that block, you know, mm -hmm. falter. Everything else, Zergo has haste, essentially, because you're going to be playing him with Dash. Yeah. Monastery Swiss Spear, haste. Lightning Berserker, haste. Obviously Dash. And then Goblin Rabble Master is just insane. So there's a reason why you're playing four of this Foundry Street Denison, just because it's so explosive. It's just crazy, yeah. It's just so explosive. So, yeah, the, his deck is crazy. Um, it's And it's actually extremely cheap to build. Uh, that's the really nice thing yeah. about, you know, red deck wins just in general has always been really cheap to build. Obviously the main card being the most expensive and most... Uh, most specific to playing this deck and having it be successful is the Goblin Rabble Master. I think they're like, what, still 20 bucks? Are they really? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty intense. Hmm. A little a little measly rare that used to be $2 out of M15. It's like 20-something bucks. That's crazy. I didn't realize they had gone up that high. Yeah, yeah. And I did, I did think his, his uh, Become Immense, like just the single Become Immense. Oh, man. Talk about the, talk about the Timmy... The Timmy heart just right. keep keep the Timmy alive, you know. So yeah, I I really enjoyed that deck. I also uh, also enjoyed uh, Andre Strauski's Green Devotion deck. Uh, I thought that he was able to show off the power of Dragonlord of Tarka and and the the versatility to Surak the Hunt Caller. I mean that card we saw it in the you know in the spoiler and in all the preview cards and things like that and people thought oh man that's got to be a really good card it's got to give haste to something turns out you know you play surak on turn four 
and you ramp into Dragonlord Atarka, maybe turn 5 or turn 6 because you've had mana dorks, and all of a sudden you've got a hasty Dragonlord Atarka coming out with a 5-4 as backup and a 8-8 eight, eight flying trample that did 5 damage to the board. It's just, yeah. it's intense, man. Let's talk about Dragonlord Atarka for a second. Three different decks. Yeah. <laughs> Three top 8s. Yeah. I mean... It's crazy. I mean, obviously the honorable mention here is Dragonlord Silumgar because of the interaction. I don't know how many people caught it, but the interaction with uh, Shota, Yas- Shota Yasuoka's deck uh, playing the black-blue uh, control versus Andre Strauski's green-red. Uh, <laughs> you had Dragonlord Atarka coming down, and you're thinking, oh man, there's nothing you could do. And then he plays Dragonlord Silumgar, taking control of Atarka. And then the next turn, Strowski plays Dragonlord Atarka, killing the Solemgar, <laughs> taking back his Atarka. And obviously, legend legend rule applies. He has to like, let go of one of his Atarkas. So the follow-up play is Shota plays another Dragonlord Solemgar and just takes control again. It's just dragons, dragons, dragons. It's just... It's, it's intense, just, man. Just the odds of them each having two yeah. Dragonlords sitting in exactly. their hands. Exactly. That just, that just cracks me up. And you know what's actually, uh, actually a very interesting point about that is that Shota Yasuoka only plays two Dragonlord yep. Silumgars. So <laughs> it's yeah. not like it's not like there was that big of a window to have that in his deck, you know. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Andre at least has four Atarkas, but exactly. it's just having two having two Silumgars sitting in your hand is just awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely say my player that I was rooting for to win the whole thing was Shota Yasuoka. Um, he's been an, a player for many years, like a really popular player in the pro circuit. And uh, he's always extremely humble, extremely calm. Uh, I like his play mannerisms and his play style. And this deck, oh my god, this black-blue dragon control deck. I'm in love with this deck. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's That deck is totally, totally my play style. Just... Oh hey, yeah, I'm just gonna kill everything that you have, and if I can't kill it, I'm gonna counter it, and I'm just gonna attack you with a couple dragons. Yeah. And there's not anything you can do about it because I'm gonna counterspell everything. Yeah, and I mean, it's been said by a lot of people, sure, but Silmgar Scorn is literally counterspell in this deck, and I love the days of me of having me some counterspell. I love mm-hmm. those days. So. Yep. <laughs> All right. So next up. Um, we just want to, you know, say congratulations to Martin Dang for his win and uh, his forty thousand dollar purse. So, Woo-hoo. yeah, I, I mean, I'm hoping one day the Pro Tour gets grows to be something like a, you know, five hundred thousand dollar purse, something like that. I think we're past the days of a forty thousand uh, dollar prize pool being the the top end of the Pro Circuit. I mean, when you have Grand Prix paying out thousands upon thousands of dollars for the thousands upon thousands of attendees and you have uh in las vegas pretty soon pretty soon we're gonna have uh, the modern masters grand prix and it's already surpassed four thousand uh pre-registered uh players so when are we gonna get more money into this i mean hasbro owns it shouldn't does doesn't forty thousand dollars feel weak it, it absolutely does, and it's, it's actually kind of interesting. I was just reading an article about this. Uh, with with that Grand Prix that's coming up, they're going to try to set the new record for a card game. Uh, it's currently held by the World Series of Poker at 8,700. They're trying to get 10,000 Magic players to participate in that tournament. And I just, I mean, I know, you know, the, the entry fee for the, the World Series of Poker is a lot more than sure. a Grand Prix, but yeah. still, like, they got to be making enough money to, to up the purse a little bit. Well, here's the thing about that, too, is you're saying that it's more expensive to play the World Series Poker. These Those things pay out in cash. I mean, yeah. granted, the Pro Tour pays out $40,000 cash, and that might seem like a lot for a little kid's card game, but the thing is, those card games are have a huge following. I'm sure that you know millions of people play poker and everything like that. I think Wizards calculated something like the estimated number of DCI players that were unique DCI players that have, are actively playing within the past couple of years uh, are well over into the 15, maybe even almost, dare I say, like almost 20 million players at this point. So that's an insane number, an insane number. I mean, 
two years ago it was 12 million so that's insane when you think about it i mean is do you really think that that many people are out there playing poker I mean, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there's at least. I'm, sh- I'm sure. Th- I'm, I'm sure there's more people playing poker just because poker is such a bright, broad like I mean, it it encompasses so many different games. <laughs> it's, sure, sure. But it's been e- around forever too. Even so, I mean, yeah, there's so many people playing Magic. I think if there was more people playing like serious competitive tournament Magic, I think they they probably would up the up the per- purse a little bit. Yeah. Like if they start hitting the eight to ten thousand range for for most tournaments, I would be shocked if they if they yeah. don't up the per- up the purse. Yeah. But I think the I mean the only reason the World Series of Poker, the only reason they get paid so much is, you know, they have eight thousand people and each of them pays ten thousand dollars to play and sure <laughs> all that exactly. money gets split between like the top eighty or something. Exactly. Yeah. Um. One thing actually to uh to inform you, I'm. I'm because you're saying that maybe if we broke the 10,000 mark, while I was watching the Pro Tour last night, Rich Hagen, he's part of the coverage team uh, for Wizards of the Coast, uh, he announced that the Modern Masters Grand Prix that's going to be happening May 30th through the 31st has already reached over 10,000 pre-registered uh, players. So in Chiba, Japan, they were, they were only set up to play uh, or to have enough coverage for one gp so what what i mean by that is for every four or five thousand players i think it's four thousand uh you have to have at least uh one standalone grand prix tournament so if you exceed four thousand that overflow of people will then go to a second uh tournament in your same venue it's just as long as your venue can hold that you know how you run multiple drafts at a at an fnm it's similar to that now you're holding multiple gps in the same uh venue so uh for this one chiba has already cra- uh has already reached its peak at 4000 and has is now completely done you can't even go to chiba anymore all of it's all the registration is closed um utrecht is over it's it's in the Netherlands. It's over 2,000 players have have registered for that one. And in Las Vegas, you have over 4,000 people already pre-registered for Las Vegas, uh, Nevada. So, I mean, I could see them breaking maybe six or seven thousand for Las Vegas. I mean, I feel like maybe it's a stretch to get eight thousand. Uh, but as we as we start seeing more and more cards spoiled for Modern Masters, I think Wizards is kind of done people a disservice by not spoiling things a little sooner do you know what i'm saying yeah i mean you're gonna build up you're gonna build up a lot more and just you're gonna build up a lot more anticipation if you spoil everything early just i mean i get i get the way they do it because they want to slowly ramp into it but if you're if your tournaments are, are being based around something like that you should just be like, oh, hey, by the way, here's everything. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure, obviously, if they start to spoil, uh, like, crazy, epic, awesome cards that everyone's going to want, then, you know, you start getting those tag-on uh, attendees and, you know, participants at the last minute. Now, since Chiba's already sold out, Utrecht has 2,000, and Vegas Vegas can support up to 10,000. So they want to get to that point, and... I think they probably will get closer to maybe like seven, like I was saying. Yes. Um, but like I said, the disservice that they're actually doing is by not, not hyping it even more because if they start doing spoilers, if they did a spoiler, say, Hey, guess what? We're printing like Elish Norn and all kinds of other stuff. If they start saying stuff like that and they start giving, uh, they give players that incentive to go then you have an, another maybe two or three thousand people that just jump on at the last minute. Those people will get that extra month and a half before the event to plan their flights, to plan hotels, all this different stuff. That stuff takes time. Otherwise, yeah. you're making your players have to pay a premium, and you're what you're doing right now is you're asking them to go blind in the dark. Guess what? We only have Tarmogoyf and Karn Liberated and like Edge Champion that are going to be in this set. So. The people that are, that know what's being printed in this, they don't know other than those three cards, and I feel like that's a disservice to the players. I, I can tell you right now, if 
if if I were interested, I mean, I'm not going to go to Las Vegas. I have too much stuff going on here. But if it was something that I was interested in doing, I would be much more inclined to do it if I knew what I was getting into at least a month before I was getting into it. Right, right. I mean, I'm not going to... I'm not going to request, you know, a, a, an entire weekend off from work just on the off chance that there's some stuff that I want. Like, exactly. That's, exactly. that's not that's not something that I'm willing to do. I know there are people that are are willing to do it, but I think a lot of people, especially like the the older players who have you know established lives with families and stuff, like it's harder to it's harder to just get away for the weekend, like a solid four days to go to Las Vegas to play in a tournament. So, exactly. I mean, you know, if you're giving people enough time to plan everything around it, it's it's a lot easier to to handle. Right. Now, we definitely aren't saying don't go to the GP. Go no. to the GP if you can. If you're one of those types of people that can go, this is the magic event to go to. This is going to be the biggest event to go to. The The funding and the vendors that will be at this event and the artists, I mean, the people, just the breadth of people that you're going to be able to trade with is going to be insane. But that said, there is something to be said that all the people that are going to be going to this event, that set releases that weekend to the point where we can play, you know, uh, I'm my local card shop, our local card shop, Creators Cards and Comics in Modesto, California, you know, those guys are going to be getting Modern Masters 2015 edition. Yeah. They're going to have boxes. I plan on buying a box. I'm I'm not sure how many other of my friends are planning on buying boxes, but I, I plan on getting the product without having to go to Vegas and without the headache of getting a hotel, without the headache of having to travel, without the headache of being around 10,000 sweaty men all yeah. day. And I mean, you know, I love the Magic community, but I personally don't have the urge to go and sit in a in a convention hall with people playing Magic. Now, I love magic. I have Black Lotus tattooed on my forearm. I don't mind people. It's just that uh, in a competitive format, the amount of... It's almost like you, it's like a palpable salt in the air. You know what I mean? Uh, people aren't having fun. Half the people are winning, half the people are losing. So there's a negativity in the air at these GPs and at these events that I... That kind of turns me off as a player. Now... That doesn't necessarily mean that that I don't like going to GPs in general. I love GPs. They're fun to go to on like day twos. Day one is super cutthroat competitive, and people will get mad and be. You'll. It's not. Uh, it's not. It's not a rare case to see a player walking angrily down an aisle out of the venue, like storming off because they lost a match. You know, um, and players talking negatively about their opponent that they lost to. Uh, I understand you got to vent and let off steam, but that still leaves an, a, an atmosphere of salt and bitterness to be picked up by others around you. Um, so I personally just enjoy going to GPs for day two fun stuff, like uh, food with friends and artists meeting up and like signing cards and things like that. And obviously selling uh, selling extra cards that you don't need to a vendor so that they can you can get cards that you actually want for decks you know maybe you got a cube maybe you've got edh decks tiny leader whatever or maybe even standard and you want to pimp out your standard deck or whatever vendors are going to have all that stuff because on day two uh players are going to be selling off their stuff and you can just trade in stuff you don't want for all this stuff in their store and it's it's really nice at that point so yeah i i mean you know i'm not super competitive like i like to draft and stuff but i yeah. Every once in a while, I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll play standard. And then I start building it. I'm like, eh, never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I, I think I would enjoy like the day two, just just honestly, just to just to go hang out for sure with That's, people and check stuff out. Man, I've been wanting us to do that forever. Uh, we we get local GPs here in California all throughout the state. Uh, San Diego is a little far for me, but San Jose and Oakland or Sacramento, those are the three that I He's really like go to. Yeah. Those are day trips. You know, you, yeah. everybody gets in the car. We go and we get to the event at like 10, maybe 11 in the afternoon. And the event hall will be open till 7 PM. So you get a good solid out eight hours of trading, going to vendors, and then we'll take a lunch break. Everyone will be together. We can go get a, we can go grab a beer. Like it's pretty awesome when you think about it. Um, and I've been def that's one of the things I really want to indoctrinate Chewy into because back in the day when we started, 
we didn't even think about going to GPs. When I thought of a GP, I thought like, man, that must be like the pro tour. Holy yeah. cow. That's awesome. <laughs> but GPs are open events to the public. Like I couldn't even bring that in my own brain. That's how, you know, new I was to this game. I had, you know, I had this mysticism about even just a Grand Prix. So uh, thinking about going to Grand Prix with everyone, especially for new players, I want to blow Chewie's mind by taking him to a Grand Prix and just having him see how many people are around or how many people are around and how many vendors there are to just look at cards. And he's going to be like, man, holy crap. (laughs) I want to take a second and tell everyone about our MTG merchandise. Uh, We have uh, MTG Mind Games merchandise uh, hosted through tchip.com. You can buy buy Acolyte t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and phone cases. And pretty soon we'll have the Wake the Dead merchandise on there as well with our logo for any of the followers that want to purchase those items for themselves. Um, through tchip.com you can purchase one of these and the proceeds will go directly toward helping the channel grow and become bigger and better Uh, we've got a lot of plans for the community and the channel and each item helps us get closer to the ultimate goal of being able to bring you the viewer and listener free magic related content for the foreseeable future of course the proceeds would be funding things like promotion events um giveaway contests uh as well as cameras microphones lighting other things that we might need to record and get these things even bigger and better uh we aren't asking anyone for a handout we want you guys to purchase t-shirts so that you can have a t-shirt or a hoodie for yourself and you'll also be helping us grow uh so we both win you know um other than that though we can move on um do you have anything with tiny leader that you want to talk about today I dude, I have been so busy this week with with all like jury duty and stuff. I haven't even had a chance to do any kind of tiny leader stuff. Right. All right. So, are you okay? So, I don't have to put this in the cast or not. But are you part? Are you actually going to have to be going in for jury duty? No. Okay. So you no. you got dismissed. Yeah, there was literally like 15 of us left sitting in the room like, oh my gosh, are they going to dismiss any more jurors? I don't want to be stuck on a week-long trial. Yeah, yeah, right on, right on. So you are free. I'm yeah. free. <laughs> like, I'm currently working on my Ragnar list. Uh, it's almost done, but I'm waiting on a handful of cards with uh, from Puka Trade, and I'll be able to bring you guys a deck tech uh, to the channel after that, but... Uh, this past Friday, I went down to Creers and I drafted and traded and things like that. And uh, Josh Bills came by after you had left. Oh, did he? Yeah, um, he came by and he was just, you know, he was just, he saw that me and you had communicated back and forth, like, are you coming to the shop type thing? And <laughs> and so he just hopped on. He, you know, he has this way about not communicating yeah. to us that he's like, on his oh, way. Oh, cool, they're going. <laughs> yeah, cool, they're going. I guess I'll come too. So all of a sudden he just shows up. He's like, hey, what's up? And I'm just like, dude, why don't you tell me you're coming? Like, I could have waited to draft or something, you know, or that way we could have gotten in on something. But uh, <laughs> he comes by and he told me about how he put his cards, uh, his older stuff into a binder so that it's more presentable for people uh, to trade. And, mm-hmm. oh, man. Josh Bills' binder is insane. Ridiculous. Josh Bills is one of those guys who he has been playing Magic forever. And back before the creation of TCG Player, um, it was, you know, the Wild West of buying and selling Magic cards. People would snipe things on eBay and just all kinds of stuff. Buying and selling play sets on eBay was the way to go. And uh, this was before we even knew about GPs as well. So he would go on eBay and he would buy play sets up just over and over and over and foil place at here foil place at there to the point where he has he's sitting on something like seven or eight azusa's foil seedborn play sets oh. like play sets of sensei's defining tops i mean he's got play sets of karns in his binder it's just oh insane when you think about it because so much time has gone by that these things literally just exploded in value because of modern and he purchased all this stuff way before modern when this stuff was still being played just because he wanted one of them for his deck you know so josh bills is i mean at the time when we were when we started doing this uh the rest of us we only had a very small amount of trade that we could trade amongst each other and he ended up having the pimped out binder of foil play sets here and there and stuff and you're just like dude i can't even 
I can't even begin to do anything against your like recurring nightmare insane combo that you have going on. So ridiculous. Like, uh, he's all recurring nightmare combo, crazy stuff, blah, blah, blah. Seaborn Muse, I'm going to play stuff during your turn, all this stuff. Take control of your turn, do this. And you're just like, Fiashino Cutthroat? Attack yeah. for five? <laughs> it has to go back to my hand? Like, that that's the power level that we were dealing with at the time. I mean... So, so Josh Bills comes by and he ends up uh, wanting to trade with people and stuff like that. And it's just funny because you start looking through his binder and people who want to play EDH start looking at his stuff and you're just, they're just like, I can't even begin to trade with you. There's nothing he even <laughs> really wants because he has everything. He has everything. So, <laughs> it's just, it's a very, you know, it's a very interesting situation that he's in. I've, I've, he didn't even know about GPs really. So he's one of those uh, players that I'm trying to get to come with me to a GP so that he can just bring his binder to a vendor and show them, hey, if I can't trade this stuff to my local scene. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna ship this stuff to a uh, ship my binder to a vendor so that I can get a piece of power because he could easily get to a piece of power when oh, yeah. pages when pages are like five hundred dollars on that page, eight hundred dollars on that page, two hundred, two hundred, two hundred. You're just you get to a piece of power really quick. Really so, fast, yeah. Yeah. So he's. I asked him like, "What's your end goal?" And he's like, "To get a piece of power." And I was like, "Okay, well then pick your piece of power. We'll go to a GP. Done." Like yep. you're going to leave there with an ancestral recall or you're going to leave there with a piece like a mox or something. So, yeah. um, yeah, he's, he's excited about that now. So he's, that's why I was, uh, I was talking to everyone about going to GPs and things like that for the day two and like trading and things like that. So, um, let's see here. How'd you end up doing in your draft? Oh, okay. So I drafted, um, I didn't do very well. Um, I think the reason why I didn't do very well is because I drafted my seat wrong. Uh, I should have gone green white instead of black white. Um, the problem was I feel like I had the curse of the good card. Yeah. So <laughs> I open up a foil Dramoka, and uh, I open up foil Dragon Lord Dramoka in my first pack. I take that snap take past the pack. From then on, I started just getting black white. There were ways so many hints that black was just wide open. And I mean, it's correct to just. If you open a good card, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to play with it. But if I saw that it was white, and white is so strong in dragons that I knew I was going to be able to play white, and if I needed to splash green, it's only one green for Jamoka, and she's a six drop anyway, so I would be able to run that card if I needed to. So I moved into white black uh, because the black signs were there. Some of the notable uncommons that were coming my way were like Acid Spewer Dragon. Um, and we had stuff like uh, like Coat with Venom, Deathwind, Defeat, Flatten. Flatten was the one I was thinking of. And Faltung Invocation. And getting some of those dragon... You know, I if I was going to have a Dragon Lord, I also ended up getting two Evolving Wilds. And in my third pack, I was able to just pull all the fixing I needed. Um, I ended up going against a Mono Red deck <laughs> on my first round. And I lost, obviously. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, mono red versus you know mid range dragons, you're gonna lose. So, um, I was able to hold them off for a while, but just I mean, giving something double strike uh, when it's that five one that that mega morphs into a six two and pings for one, I yeah. mean that thing killed me in like one shot. <laughs> like, I was just like, I think it was like turn four or five he. He attacks with another, like a 3-2, and that morph creature, I don't block because I'm at 15 or 16. And then he unmorphs it and gives a double strike, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm uh, dead. All right. <laughs> I guess I die. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is this? Is this standard? Like, <laughs> so, That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that guy, he always plays... <laughs> he always plays a very aggressive red deck. He's always the one drafting red, and he'll force it. Even if he's going to lose, he's going to force it. So, I mean, sometimes you just stick to what you're good at, and that's what he's good at. And, I mean, I should have known better. I, I should have known, because I didn't realize who I was playing until after it was too late. And I was just like, oh, man, he's going to play red. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's fine. You know, you get – I got – I'm more of happy to get my value out of the draft rather than just win the draft. I don't care about the Planeswalker points. I mean, getting some of the packs to open on the channel would be nice, but – you know, I I got the Dragon Lord. I got uh, I think I opened a Wooded Foothills and there you go. Uh, a Frontier Siege. So you know, I recouped my cost and I got some pretty sweet looking cards too. So yeah, I was happy about it. I wasn't 
I never I never care about losing. I'm not in it to just win all the time. So, um, I, when I started my draft, I had planned on I had planned on going three color because I saw that uh, my first pack I had Profaner of the Dead, sure, which is the, the the wizard with exploit. Yeah, and I was like, oh man, that'd be really cool. Maybe I'll put together you know blue, white, black exploit, and you know I'll get my little bit of control. White super strong, and then after the first round, after the 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 first round of packs went around, I was like, huh. I only had like two black cards come back to me. <laughs> Maybe I'll just skip black. And then the, the deck that I ended up with, man, <laughs> just blue, white, Megamorph. Nice. Could not be touched. Just couldn't be touched. Even like my, my big bombs, I had ward scale dragon and shield high dragon. Sure. So I had, you know, the two uncommon guys and that, that shield high dragon is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, the life link is extremely relevant on that guy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and then, uh, but the my big my big guys that were doing work the entire time mm -hmm. out of out of all the cards I could have drafted was are the the Goodle Goodle Lurker. Yeah, Goodle Lurker. So, yeah, the Goodle Lurker. <laughs> Him and Mist Hoof Karen. <laughs> like, oh yeah, Mist Hoof Karen is legit. Those two guys were just beating down everybody. Yeah, and I even drafted like I drafted two uh, Ojutai monuments. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I'm gonna have a you know a couple monuments in there. Sure. Never played either one of them. <laughs> wow. I didn't negate a single thing. Uh, I did. I never used Silumgar Sorcerer to counter anything. <laughs> I never. I literally was just beating people down with dragons and. The Kirin, and every, every once in a while, when a flyer was out to block, I mm. uh, just pacified it. Sure. <laughs> like, oh my god. I was like, hey, hey, check out this pacifism on your only flying creature. Now take this mist of Karen again. Yeah. Oh, and <laughs> I forgot the other thing that was that was people were not happy about is a like, honors reward. <laughs> honors reward. So it's the it's two and a white instant. Sure. Gain four life, bolster two. <laughs> oh man. So I was turning that the the good old lurker into a four four unblockable, or I was turning the mist of Karen into a what is that a four three flying vigilance? Yeah. Oh my god. No, a five a five four flying vigilance after the morph. Wow. Just untouchable at that point, which is why I went to the top two. We ended up splitting, but sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. So, so actually, if you want to do a pack opening at any time, I have six packs sitting in front of me. Oh yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do pack opening in a second here. Uh, we definitely want to crack into those. I know you've been dying to crack into dying. those. I'm actually, I want to applaud you for your uh, your resilience to not open those packs. I mean, <laughs> you've been won, sitting there for two days. Yeah, you won those on Friday. Those things have been sitting on your desks for two days, and it's now Sunday that we're recording. Like holy cow! And man. I bought a pack of cons this morning because I saw it, I, Walgreens had cons instead of dragons, and I was like, oh, oh nice. I'm gonna get a pack of cons. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I want to say before we do some pack openings, um, I wanted to give a shout out real quick, uh, to Megan and Tyler. Uh, from Darium CCGs. Well, Tyler's not from Darium's, but Megan is. We want to say congratulations to them for their new YouTube channel. They got, I think it was 2,000 subscribers within the first two days. It was just insane. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, it's going to be such a great uh, following for their channel. It's it's intense, dude. Uh, if any of you are friends or, um, or listeners of Darium CCGs on YouTube, uh, you'd know that that shop is... I mean, that's the ideal shop that you want to play at. The atmosphere that you want to be around, those are the types of players that come in and you have more like a family. You know, that that's the type of community you want to be a part of. Um, Megan has uh, stepped away from Darium CCGs, and in her free time, she's going to be uh, creating a YouTube channel called The Pillow Fort with Tyler, where they're going to stream, review video games. You know, it's a gaming channel, so any of you guys that like games, and obviously if you're fans of Magic, you can go over to Darium CCGs, where they offer... Uh, a crate a monthly crate service it's actually extremely beneficial to players because they sell the crates at cost and the players are able to get that at cost with a very you know it's it's, it's extremely cheap you end up getting something like six or seven like packs and then you get a, a play mat and some dice and stickers tokens different things like that and just really cool for only like 20 bucks a month it totally beats the crap out of the old, uh, you know, monthly magic box that used to be from back in the day. So, um, but for years I've watched that magic community online and, uh, 
because they've been posting videos for a couple of years now and uh, sharing their experiences through the Card Shop Life uh, video series. And I mean, it's hilarious. I've ordered pizza for those guys. I've, you know, like they're in Ohio. I'm in California, but I feel like. I was inspired to create this YouTube channel and bring my community together based off of their, you know, interaction with their community and how easy, well, it might not be easy, but you know, how just a little bit of effort and a little bit of thinking ahead and producing a video and putting it out there for the world to see, you know, can change just your community to be this tight knit thing. So I definitely recommend checking out the Pillow Fort, Dirium CCGs, all of those guys, and I wish them luck in their endeavors. Um, one last shout out I want to give to Bad Wolf MTG. Uh, Bad Wolf highlights several creative ways that Magic players or enthusiasts can show their love for the game through arts and crafts. Uh, she has this craft magic series on her YouTube channel. Uh, we'll leave links and everything to everyone's websites uh, in the description of this video. And I've been a fan of her videos for a while, and that has sparked my interest in sharing my own craft ventures with our viewers as well. Now, Evan, I know you know um, that, like, I'm I'm not as resourceful as she might be with creating, uh, like, cup holders and, and, you know, towels and things like that for your bathroom. And just, I'm not that creative, but I am in taking old booster pack covers. <laughs> I mean, I... I don't know if this is a hoarder thing, but <laughs> I used to take old booster pack covers that I would have lying around um, from opening packs of like Portal, Urza Saga, stuff like that. And I would keep the, the, the covers, cut out the picture on the front and make a design on uh, those cheap white boxes that you'd get from your local LGS or whatever. And I would just glue them down and put some clear tape on there, like packaging tape. And that makes kind of like a I don't know what you'd call it just um it just makes a nice cover for, for it, decorative right? top yeah it's like a decorative top perfect so um it also is nice because if you have multiple five row boxes and you're putting those on top of them you that could be your you know that could be your unique box that you have so uh it just it differentiates the different boxes that you have in your closet when you start getting three and four and five five row boxes in your collection it sucks to have to look through every single one lift them all up and everything when you can just put all the bulk the true bulk in the other you know basic five rows that you have and you have that one five row that has the cool cover that you made and you're like oh yeah i put that in the urza's destiny box or i put that my uncommons in the modern masters box and the you know i took all of my packs from modern masters and put them on this box covered it with tape and now i had this nice um protected box and plus the tape also protects it from water damage too so if you uh if maybe a drink spills on top of your cards or whatever at least the cover <laughs> you know maybe you know you put your cup on top of it or something obviously i would not suggest doing that <laughs> oh my god i don't even know what i'm saying right now but yeah but you know it's it's just a little customization that i like doing uh with some of my stuff i haven't done it in a while so i'm going to showcase some of that on um on a future episode that we that we uh that we produce for mtg mind games uh with our own crafts and we can share that with the bad wolf mtg community as well we might just have to uh draft a box at some point oh yeah just so i can packs. get yeah just so i can get new <laughs> packs to create it yeah i think oh man okay so now this truly is probably a bad hoarder type deal right but i i still to this day have uh covers from packs of portal from when <laughs> me and you first opened portal when i was like like 17 or 16 so um I still have those and I've been saving them with my packs of alliances, my packs of visions, my like you know these these old packs from when we first started playing in Mirage and stuff like that. So yeah, um I'm I've been saving those. I'm not sure what I want to put them on or how I want to do it, but I think I might have to do it pretty soon here just so I can get something uh together for the channel so that people can see what yeah. I'm talking about. All right. So without any further ado, Evan, take us away in a, a crack a pack opening. I think what we're going to do is open this cons because it's cons. Sure, <laughs> sure. I'm always more excited about cons. I'm not saving this for you, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I assume. I assume. All right, so just running through this cons pack real quick. Uh, you know, we got the pretty basic commons, you know, feed the clam, kill shot, cancel. 
that's obviously right at my right in my wheelhouse right there. Sure. Uh, and then we got Dragon Grip, which I really I, I really like that card. I think it's got some good some good stuff to it. Yeah. Abzan Charm. How can you go wrong with a charm in any pack oh, ever? Yeah. Charm. Those charms are powerful. We got an Air of the Wilds. Uh, you know, two two Death Touch for two. All, always good. Yep. That guy's Especially when it's good. got when it's got the ferocious. Yep. And then Master of Pearls. Uh, you know, the, the morph cost, while it might be a little bit high for some stuff. Sure. You know, in thing, in settings like EDH, yeah. I mean, paying five to give all your creatures plus two plus two, you, you, you're not going wrong with that, especially yeah. in white, who doesn't usually get stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Now, in this first pack of dragons, let's see. We've got a dragon fodder. Always off to a good start when you get a dragon fodder. Okay. Glaring Aegis. Okay. Not bad, you know. Yeah. We've got Marsh Hulk. I'm I'm big on the Mega Morph now. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Blues Calm. With a Glade Watcher. I saw that a couple times in draft this week. I didn't realize how good it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Monastery Lore Master. Ojitai Summons. Always fun. That card's powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Ancestral Statue. Sprinting War Brute. I'm not that big into Dash, but he seems pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, paying four for to get a five four haster is not bad. Yeah. Naturalized classic. Yep. Scion of Ugin. Which I don't think I've actually seen one of those out of a oh, pack. Oh man, yet. yeah. Okay, so you open a Scion. Yeah, that. That is to me. That's the chase uncommon. <laughs> I said I talk about this in the box opening because when I had opened, I, w I did the pre-release. I did fat packs. I did a box. Out of all that, I only saw one Scion of Ugin because it looks like an Eldrazi. You know what I mean? Eldrazi were colorless. It's not an artifact creature. It's a colorless yeah. creature. So, uh, and it's got that full picture frame. So it's really sweet. I've been wanting a foil, and like for some reason, I just am never getting sent a foil on Puka Trade. <laughs> like, I don't know why. And they're only worth like a dollar something as a foil, which doesn't seem right because I, out of all those products, I only saw one. So yeah. then, when I was opening the second box, I opened, I opened one, and then I even even said that i was like oh man i only saw one of these in my previous box then literally my next pack i opened another one so i was like wait wow way to way to prove me wrong nice. <laughs> but yeah i really like that one that card's awesome all right and then after the scion we have an orator of ujutai nice. the ojutai yeah which is yeah, like pretty the, cool. the functional some, pristine angel type or whatever some, some white draw power yeah can't really hate on that uh we got a we got a bloodshed rager I don't really know this guy, but I know Black White Warriors. People are trying to. I heard I heard a lot of people talk about that on at Criers oh, okay. on Friday. Yeah, no, the Orator. Cool. The Orator is like what is it? I thought you were talking about the other dragon. Sorry, the Orator is the uh, if you have a dragon, it's basically Wall of Omens, right? Yeah, it's a zero four defender flying for two mana. Yeah, that's uh, a bird monk, and if you reveal a dragon or control a dragon, you draw a card. Yeah, it's even better than. Than Wall of Omens, actually, because yeah. Wall of Omens doesn't have flying. So, okay. So then we got the the Bloodshed Rager, two two for two. It's a black human warrior. Okay. When it attacks, each warrior creature you control can't be blocked this turn except by two or more creatures. Yeah, that's crazy. That's pretty ridiculous. And then we got a Dragon Tempest, which I don't uh, like any of my packs with red, but you know. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> that's just because of my play style. Yeah. That's pretty cool, though. It's got, it's, got some, it's got some stuff to it. Yeah. Uh, all right. We're going to get something good in this pack, though. I can feel it. I want you to get a foil mythic. I want you, to get, a, I want you to get a foil dragon whisperer. <laughs> all right. Let's see what we got here. We got a hardened berserker. Sounds good. Territorial rock. Another marsh hulk. Yay. <laughs> Palace familiar. Eh, commons. We got a flatten. Lions Herald of Dromoka. I like Herald of Dromoka a lot. Herald of Dromoka is actually really good, yeah. Yeah. That's definitely one of those top picks for the draft. Yeah, for sure. Uh, then we got, we're just going to get into the uncommons here. We got Dance of the Skywise. Okay. Which I don't know that one. Until the end of turn, target creature you control becomes a blue dragon illusion with base power and toughness 4-4. Four, four. Loses all abilities and gains flying. So, turns anything into a 4-4 four, four flying dragon for two mana for a turn. Yeah. It's, it's blues. It's blues. Little trick that they have. Blue doesn't really yeah. get tricks like that very often. So, a rending volley. Oh man, I'm glad nobody got any of these to play against. Yeah, your deck. yeah. That is the hate <laughs> card against your deck. So, yeah. Oh man, that would have sucked. <laughs> and then we got a we got an Atarka monument. Okay. 
There is a uh, no no foil mythic in here. There is a warrior token, uh, but then the rare we got a harbinger of the hunt. A harbinger of the hunt. Now I think this card is actually going to be worth a little more than than uh, in the long run, in the very long term. Um, immediately it's going to stay around like a dollar probably, right? Because I think it's only like twenty five cents or a dollar. Is it? Yeah, it's not very expensive, but th- it's resilient. Because it doesn't kill itself when it wraths. You know what I'm saying? As long as you're paying for it with, with green. Oh, no, it's each creature without flying. Yeah. Each, yeah, each other creature without flying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think he'll probably... Somebody will build around him eventually or include him in a deck, and he'll he'll, he'll go up a little bit. I mean, not super high or anything, obviously. Yeah, but... it's, it feels like one of those 2 or $3 dragons. In, like, five years, maybe it might be it might be a little better, you know? Yeah. It's something I'm I'm sure it'll end up in an EDH deck of mine <laughs> you know, sure. at some point, like when I rebuild Naya or something. Yeah, it, it lends itself perfectly to like a Karthus build too, because Karthus is the Jun colors and this guy is red green, so yeah. Yeah. All right, so now we got three more packs left of dragons here. By the way, this is the first time I think I've ever finished high enough in a uh, in a draft to actually get packs out of it. For real? Oh. Yeah. Man. Well then, because yeah. I usually I usually end up like uh, I usually end up paired against you or something. Oh <laughs> yeah, no, that's I'm like, right. All right, well there goes this. <laughs> there goes this one. Well, that that obviously is the problem when you're playing so much. Like I think it was like shards when we used to draft a lot. It would be yeah. me, you, Josh Duma, Josh Bills, and and you know maybe Alex or maybe you know there was like a else. guaranteed five or six people in the draft who knew exactly what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, and it was usually your uh, each other. Like it was all of yeah. us. So is. It doesn't lend well when you're playing against your buddies, and then you just make them lose, so, yeah. Yeah. All right, so in this one... Ooh, I got my Mist of Karen. I love that card so much now. That's, like, that's like my favorite white card out of this set now. But we're nice. just going to skip back to the uncommons here. Yeah. We got a, a Silumgar Scorn. Ooh, so that was already, a good one. Yeah, I'm very happy about that. Yep. And we got Scale Guard Sentinels. Okay. Which I don't know that one. It is a battlefield with a 1-1 one, one counter if you build a dragon. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 3-4 for two mana if you have a dragon. Mm-hmm. Can't hate on that. We got a Surge of Righteousness. Okay. Surge is a good sideboard card. Yeah, it is. And then we got a we got a card that has... It got a lot of talk, I believe, in our in our first episode. I got a Mirror Mocker. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So that'll, that'll definitely be getting put into a deck at some point in the for next sure. few days. Yeah, <laughs> abuse that thing. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, for sure. Uh, let's get this guy open. I, am, I can't believe I haven't gotten a single foil yet. That is surprising, actually. Five packs in. Got another Herald of Dromoka. All right. We got a Colagon Monument, which I think I've gotten three different monuments out of yeah. four packs. Yeah. And we got a Seismic Rupture. Two damage to each creature without flying. Three mana sorcery for red. Yeah, it's a new type of Pyroclasm effect. That's yeah. That's pretty good. We got an Acid Spewer Dragon. That's pretty good. And we got a Dragon Lord Silumgar. Nice. There we go. <laughs> Ooh, and a Foil Spider Silk Net. What? <laughs> There's your foil. Boom. <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty excited about that Dragon Lord Silumgar, though. That's the first yeah. one I've gotten. Yeah. Now you can get on your way to playing Shota Yasuoka. I'm deck. building Shota's deck. <laughs> it's happening. Nice. There you go. Right, let's get this last pack. Hey, I even have a regular Silumgar sitting on my desk right now. Oh yeah, they they play so well together. It's kind of ridiculous. That was something yeah. that happened in the Pro Tour. Is that he played uh, he played the Dragon Lord, and then he played the Silumgar and was attacking and doing mini infests on their stuff. Yeah. Like, he's just infesting their their side every time. And it's, I mean, obviously, it's a complete flavor fail <laughs> by R&D to not have made these dragons where they kill each other, because they have yeah. different unique names, because of legendary yeah. rules, so yeah. Alright. Now, here we are in the last pack. Let's see. Skipping straight to the uncommons, because there wasn't really anything notable in the commons. Yeah. We got a Sarkin's Triumph. Okay. Search your library for a dragon card, put it into your hand, shuffle your library. Can't, I mean, you know, searching is always fun. Yeah. We got a Scale Blessing, which bolster one, then put a 1 1 counter on each creature you control with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. Hmm. That's not bad. Yeah. I mean, four, four mana, white, instant. Yeah, it seems fine. I wish it was three, so I could put it into a, a tiny leader. But you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, right. 
We can't it have is, everything. It is what it is. Yeah. We got an ambuscade shaman. That two, one. Two. That one's deceptively yeah. powerful. Whenever it or another creature enters the battlefield, her that creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn. Yeah. And it's got dash, so every time you dash it in, so it's a minute. It's it's going to be a four. It's not bad at all. Yeah. It's deceptively powerful, it really is. Yeah. And then the rare we got here was the Erishin Foremost. All right. Which so. two two for one and two white human warrior double strike, when it enters the battlefield or attacks. Another target warrior creature you control gains double strike until end of turn, which that will be in a deck within uh, the next hour. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I happen to have a a, a warrior a warrior tiny leader deck that is yep. just begging for this right now. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, I actually I traded off my playset of those. I had uh, out of the boxes and all the stuff that I have accumulated. I had I had accumulated a playset including a foil of that, and I was just like. I'm probably never going to play Warriors, and I just, it was so, it's so cheap, like, it's, it's, it's not an expensive card, but, uh, I could see it easily going up and being the Silver Blade Paladin, um, of the, of this set. Silver Blade Paladin, of course, was out of Avacyn Restored, where, uh, when it came into the battlefield, it would team up with another one of your creatures, giving that creature double strike, and they would both gain double strike. So it's similar to that. It actually costs the same, two white and one, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it definitely fills that role. And Silverblade Paladin at the time was something of like a $9, $10 card when it was in standard. So I could see someone playing a white, black, uh, aggressive warrior, warrior build, and this card is definitely the way to go if you're going to play a play set of these in your Warriors deck. So... Um, going forward, I think that this card is criminally undervalued uh, at at its current price. But we'll see what we'll see what happens as standard develops. Um, was that all your packs? That that was all my packs. Yeah. Okay, so at least you got a dragon lord out of it. I did get a dragon lord out of it. I got a couple good pieces for for some decks that I already have. So, that, so I mean, it just goes back to that. You know, last week we were talking about you know drafting. The, or uh, opening opening packs for value versus opening packs for the enjoyment of opening packs. Sure. And I think this is a set of packs that was definitely open for the enjoyment of opening packs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have you know, though, you did open value, though, because Silumgar has gone up since the Pro Tour. Has he? Yeah. Okay, so I watched the Pro Tour last night. I was, like, I was Johnny on the spot like a hawk trying to watch what these prices of these things were going to go up to at uh, on TCG player. Not because, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, I, it's very interesting to see the pro tour happening what live and when it's happening. And then prices on the secondary market reflecting exactly what's going on because so many people are going to, are going to want to go out and buy their copies. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened with dragon Lord of Tarka after day one, literally dragon Lord of Tarka was $7. After day one, jumped up to $15. I went to f and I was surprised to look at my phone and see Dragon Lord of Tarka from $7 to $15. And people wanted to trade for them. And my in my mind, I looked at it the night before, and I was like, yeah, Dragon Lord of Tarka is like 7 bucks." And then, I, of course, we always go to our phones and double-check prices and stuff. And then, whoa, Dragon Lord of Tarka is 15 bucks? Like, yeah. holy cow. So Dragon Lord of Tarka now has stabilized at $19. <laughs> And Silumgar, Silumgar was pre-selling at six. I purchased a few copies for myself, uh, like a playset from Troll and Toad, and got my copies at six dollars. Uh, Silumgar is now up to thirteen dollars. So there you mm. go. <laughs> I mean, uh, last night alone it was at seven fifty, and now it's gone up even just a few dollars at this point. So that's cool. Nice. Yeah. All right. So. For MTG Mind Games, I'm Scott. You can follow MTG Mind Games on Twitter or uh, find us on Facebook. I'll leave a link to those things in the description. And, uh, of course, like and subscribe the YouTube channel. We have giveaways, and we have a lot of things planned for you guys. Pretty soon we're going to be spotlighting uh, a couple different interactions with the community that we have. And, um, uh, Evan, where can people find you at? Well, I actually have have started doing stuff again online. <laughs> right on. Uh, 
I'm on Twitter uh, at CMDR Evander. It's Commander Evander because that's who I am. Yep. <laughs> I don't even know what my Instagram is, but I will get it to you guys at some point. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll leave a link at, uh, a description, a link in the description below to all of our social media information as well. Um, thank you guys for listening and. Keep it real. Keep it magic.